right, I think we're going to call the meeting to order. I'm sure there'll be others that are going to straggle in after the long uh, Thanksgiving weekend. We call the, the, the commission meeting uh, the legalization, regulation, and taxation area that we want to, to order. Uh, there are a few things I want to say before we, we have three speakers today. We have Todd Wells, who's going to speak last week, or two, last meeting, uh, from banking, and uh, David, David Luzon, so. is he here? Yeah. Okay. And who's going to speak uh, from agriculture. And then Matt Simon, who's going to, uh, who's been at this for 10 years, is going to uh, give us his wisdom on uh, what he's seeing around the country in terms of marijuana legalization. So uh, we have a new member, uh, Paul Cuny, who's uh, the member from New Hampshire Bar Association. I guess there was some miscommunication between the clerk's office and, and but we, we found someone and, and they voted to have you uh, represent us, uh, represent the Bar Association on the, uh, on the commission. That's great. Next thing I want to do is just move to the minutes real quick. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. table. Um, from the last meeting, I just need a, a motion to accept. Someone to second. I, I just, I had one minor observation, and I don't know if this no, matters or not. On the uh, top of page two, Michael Holt, who did present at the last meeting, um, I know there's just a misspelling by one letter of his last name. It's O H O L D up at towards the top, um, but then it's correctly spelled later on. Okay. So I don't know if that's worth amending or not. I think we'll just we'll correct the name for that. If that sure, sounds good. Yeah. I'll get that over the phone. But subject to that correction, I would uh, move to approve. Thank you. Second. All right. Uh, all in favor? Um, Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, very good. Um, you know, coming in here today, or well, even this morning, I saw WMUR talking about this meeting, and I heard Jack Keith talking about this meeting. And for the members in the audience, understand what we are is, we're a roll up the sleeve kind of group here. We're, we're delving into the detail, so, uh, actually, pretty boring, actually, when you start thinking about it, but we're, we're gonna get to the details uh, the good and bad, as well as ideas, what, what we've seen in other states that works the best from a, a regulatory structure. <coughs> so that's kind of things that we're, we're going to be working on. Um, our next meeting is on December, December 18th, um, and we're going to hear from Joanne Ward, who represents the Department of Revenue. Um, she has a lot. She's asked if anybody, of, um, any members, has questions that you want answered. That mean please reach out to, to Joanne in advance, uh, and she will uh, she will make sure she addresses any and we will give her a chance to prepare mm -hmm. if there's some curveballs in there. Um, and then we're going to have uh, we've been able to secure Andrew Friedman from Colorado. Um, Andrew is he's known as the marijuana czar out there. He's the he's the fellow who worked for the state that put together technical implementation and of the regulations. So uh, he knows a lot about um, what went on in Colorado during those early years. Um, so he he'll be skyping in, uh, and that's again on the on the 18th. Some of us, I think most of us are aware uh, House Bill 656 came out of uh, criminal justice and ITL. There was an active marijuana legalization bill that was left over from the spring. It was retained. It came out ITL on a 13-7 uh, to 7 vote. Uh, but uh, the bill will be, will, I'm, I'm sure, more than likely be on, heard on the floor. And I'm, I'm looking at right here, I'm sure I see one person will probably speak against the ITL. Uh, I just want to ask the, if, without objection, I would be speaking on the floor uh, in favor of the ITL motion. Uh, what I'd like to do is say the commission has sent me here 
if there's no objection to that. Um, and our grounds would be give us some time. You know, we, we just started um, why we're putting the property for the horse. So it's an ITL motion. Uh, it's a bit of an uphill battle uh, for those supporting marijuana legalization on, in this regard. But um, if, again, if there's no objection, I'm going, I'll, I'll be on the floor uh, speaking for the commission. Um, yes? Um, I guess I should start off by disagreeing with the chair, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to, um, especially since it's my first meeting. Um, I, I wouldn't vote in favor of that because I wonder if it's my first meeting, although I did attend, I think, both of the other meetings. But I, I don't think the commission should take a position on it until they actually have the information that's coming in. Because if, um, we, have, we haven't heard the information to come to any conclusions on it. Um, you know, I, have, I have no problem with that, but I will probably speak for myself. Oh, sir. As a commission member. I, I was just trying to clarify there's a difference. As a commission member, speaking for myself, versus the commission and I, in my mind one objection was enough so i will i will i will speak for myself on the floor i just want to clarify with the commissioners and i appreciate it. thank you <coughs> so um and again my my objection would be from let's let the commission have some more time to i mean there's a reason why we're here and we're putting the cart before the horse is what i'm going to basically say so by, if, you know, I'm going to support the IKL, but if that's overturned, I'm sure there'll be another pass motion on the floor. All right. Um, the only other administrative thing or uh, we want to do is pick a couple of meetings for January uh, dates. And we have a lot of states to go through. We have a lot of, uh, I think we have to meet twice a month. I think we talked about this in the first meeting. Uh, probably Mondays, probably 9 o'clock. And I'm, I'm going to suggest the 8th and the 22nd. That's okay with everybody. You can look up your calendars. Okay. What we're, while you're looking at your calendars, what we're going to continue to do is invite a representative from different states that have legalized. Um, and then if there are commission members who want uh, the floor uh, for uh, more than just uh, five minutes, please let us know and we will, especially in your area of expertise, if, if there's some facts you want to get out, we certainly would want to hear from you in a, in a way. And then the only other thing, uh, are we all set with those two dates? Okay. Did you say 22nd, right? Yes. Okay. 8th and 22nd. <coughs> all right. Um, you know, I originally came out with the, the 14 points that we would talk about the first meeting, kind of update a little bit on the second meeting. There's one other issue that came to mind that I think we want to ask these other states about, and that's Big Tobacco's involvement in legalization. Um, so I'd, I'd like to add that to the list of things. Um, I know three years ago when we, we heard Bill on the floor uh, and we came to Ways and Means and we heard testimony that all of the big tobacco companies had registered websites with marijuana in it or something to that effect. Uh, it, my impression, and we're gonna hear from agriculture, but uh, my impression is that so far mostly these are smaller farms that are, are doing this today, but we don't know. You know, is big tobacco involved? I think it's something that we should, we should understand. So that, that one just came to mind, uh, and I would, I'd like to add that to the list. No objection. Yes. Uh, one thing I didn't see in here is whatever our recommendation is or whatever we want to talk about, is there going to be an education program for the uh, people? Uh, it, it, it should be in there that we want to see what the other states are doing mm -hmm. in regard to education. Or do you mean education uh, of the facts that we gather? Or no, education of uh, whatever we decide or whatever we conclusions. We should have some kind of... A, program a recommendation for a program that educates 
uh, people on the east. Yeah. I think we. I think that's something that we should think about. Yeah. I'll add that to the. I'll add that as well to the list. Again, I mean, while we're talking about this, I mean, I really don't. I, I mean, we're a fact finding group. I mean, each of us has our own opinion. Everybody in the audience has their own opinion. I, I think, I think we need to educate. We need to find out what's worked, what's not worked, on the technical side, but also what the good and the bad is of legalization. And that's, I think, our job. And we're, and we're going to work our way through this in uh, a lot more detail than uh, a House committee could, because we have a lot more time to do it in a proper way. So that's, I think, the whole purpose of the commission. And that's what we're going to. That's what we're going to do. Now, whether this leads to legislation at the end, I don't. I don't. I don't it could be simple as education thing or whatever. But I think it's really going to be the book that's going to be used for future committees. And believe me, no matter what we find, we know marijuana is going to come up every year. Uh, legislation. So at least we, we have kind of the definitive document that says, okay, this is what we found going on in all the other states uh, for the for those committees to refer to. All right, so with that said, um, I guess our, our, first, our first speaker is Todd Wells from the Banking uh, Commission. And as you know, there's a lot of issues surrounding the use the banks, related to the banks, and the use of credit cards as well as cash going through banks uh, that we need to, to learn about. And I think uh, Todd's done some research on this already. Uh, to help us out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to my fellow commission members, uh, also to others attending here this morning. Uh, as, as it was introduced, I currently serve as the Chief Bank Examiner for the New Hampshire Banking Department, and that is within the banking division of our department. So essentially, uh, my group supervises and regulates New Hampshire chartered banks and credit unions. Uh, also, as was alluded to, I was uh, initially prepared to speak at our earlier meeting, our last meeting, and I had in fact dis uh, disseminated some rough notes for that, um, but thankfully I've been able to finalize them. So. All of you folks have uh, a copy of um, my page and a half, just my bullet points, my dialogue points I'd like to uh, hit this morning. And then I've also got some extra copies on the, uh, the table to my left. Uh, at our previous meeting of the commission on November 6th, we heard testimony from Michael Holt, and he's from the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, he's the policy administrator for the therapeutic cannabis program. Uh, Mr. Hole indicated that New Hampshire alternative treatment centers or dispensaries have established banking relationships with Century Bank in Medford, Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Holt also had provided some answers to uh, some of the other banking related questions that were formulated uh, from, from that list that we've been talking about um, from our first meeting. Uh, I want to ask, uh, feel free to pose any questions as I'm going through some of my, my various points and also feel free to seek clarity at any time throughout uh, our discussion. I, I just wanted to, uh, for purposes of distinction and clarification, identify that there's several banks and credit unions that fall outside of our department's jurisdiction. And that's not always uh, entirely well known uh, to the public and uh, to other members. Uh, so some examples of depository institutions that are outside of the New Hampshire Banking Department's uh, jurisdiction are those institutions chartered by federal regulators. So let me provide some examples. Uh, if you have a federal credit union, that's going to be chartered and supervised by the National Credit Union Administration. Uh, with some of the banks, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, or the uh, offices of the Comptroller of the Currency, uh, they could be the primary uh, supervisor. Um, especially the control of the currency for banks such as national banks, national associations, and federal savings banks. So I just wanted to identify that. Uh, for this morning's meeting, I'm prepared to speak in some general terms about banking considerations and the marijuana industry here in New Hampshire. 
and in our immediately neighboring states. I've had the opportunity to reach out to Maine, Vermont, and Massachusetts. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit uh, greater detail. Um, but I also wanted to point out that records of examinations and investigations are confidential, and that's by statute, by law. So that's why I say I'm going to talk in general terms about you know, what I'm aware of and what I've seen, um, but there may be some circumstances where I'm really not able to provide greater detail because of that confidentiality restriction. Uh, I also want to just note that I may use the term banking, uh, banks and the banking industry as, as a general reference to both banks and credit unions, and that's just for purposes of brevity. Uh, so one of the elements that I think is very important to, uh, to highlight is that our New Hampshire chartered banks and credit unions are subject to laws, rules, and guidance essentially on two levels. Certainly here in New Hampshire, we've got New Hampshire banking laws. We've also got rules that apply to our banks and credit unions. But there's also federal laws and rules and guidance that applies to these institutions. <coughs> That's a very big element when we're talking about therapeutic cannabis, um, marijuana, this um, very important. As I mentioned, uh, we've got those other regulators, the National Credit Union Administration, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Federal Reserve uh, Bank. These all are also federal agencies that provide some oversight, regulation, and supervision to these institutions. Wanted to talk uh, briefly about a couple of elements, um, and one is what's known as the Cole Memo. So in February of 2014, the U.S. Department of Justice um, through their Deputy Attorney General James Cole had issued a, a memorandum and the subject was guidance regarding marijuana related financial crimes and in this memo essentially the U.S. Department of Justice had uh, indicated that there's some key priorities that they're going to focus on relative to enforcement and the premise being that marijuana remains illegal under the Controlled Substances Act. So I'm just going to briefly hit some of these bullet point highlights because these are important to the banking industry. These priorities are uh, <coughs> preventing the distribution of marijuana to minors, preventing revenue from the sale of marijuana from going to criminal enterprises, gangs, and cartels, preventing the diversion of marijuana from states where it is legal under state law in some form to other states, preventing state authorized marijuana activity from being used as a cover or a pretext for trafficking of other illegal drugs or other illegal activity, preventing violence in the use of firearms in the cultivation and distribution of marijuana, preventing drug to driving in the exacerbation of other adverse public health consequences associated with marijuana use, preventing the growing of marijuana on public lands in the attendant public safety and environmental dangers posed by marijuana production on public lands. And then the final uh, priority was preventing marijuana possession or use on federal property. Uh, this memo importantly also established that financial institutions that conduct transactions with money generated by marijuana related conduct could face criminal liability. So I know this is um, something that many of the institutions, the depository institutions, banks and credit unions, have considered a great deal in their decisions as to whether they engage directly with marijuana-related businesses. Uh, the other, um, quickly on the heels of that memo from the Department of Justice, uh, there's another relevant organization known as the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network and the acronym for that is FinCEN, and this is essentially a division of the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Uh, FinCEN uh, recognized that the Department of Justice had issued this memo, and then FinCEN came out with via, uh, Bank Secrecy Act, or money laundering, anti-money laundering uh, compliance regulations regarding marijuana-related businesses. And basically, they produced this guidance for those financial institutions that did decide and did elect to uh, engage in some activity, uh, business activity with marijuana related businesses, that there were some expectations that those financial institutions could follow so that they were providing the best due diligence and approaching it in, in the, most, uh, the most thoughtful way possible. That was also released in February of 2014. Uh, is there a way to uh, give us copies of those? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks. Yes.
so it's important to also identify that the New Hampshire Banking Department has not to date issued any guidance or, uh, or <coughs> rulings or laws relative to banking with marijuana related businesses. So let's talk a little bit about some of the account activity that could occur. And, and I, I will tell you that while I don't necessarily have this sort of experience firsthand through, um, through the, the regulation and supervision that I provide, I know that I've heard and I've read uh, through some of the challenges that have faced other states in dealing with this is as these alternative treatment centers or dispensaries or businesses become up and running, there becomes the, the somewhat difficult issue of how do payments come in and, and, and what form do those payments take? And in some cases early on, just several years back in this industry, uh, it, it was not uncommon that some of these businesses and organizations were literally handling duffel bags full of cash. Um, so as you can imagine, that presents some challenges and some, um, some negative possibilities uh, relative to having that amount uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make it clear to myself and, and the commission that medical marijuana is treated the same way as recreational marijuana as far as banking goes? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Thank you. Sure. So the, the cash and the payments issue was certainly a challenge that I understand that was facing a lot of these businesses uh, throughout, throughout the country as a number of the states were beginning to have some measure of legalization. Uh, another element uh, is deposit accounts and a consideration. So when you think about most businesses probably have some sort of a primary commercial checking account. Um, as, you know, as we around the room think about our personal finances, we likely have some savings accounts somewhere or money markets and maybe a certificate deposit, certainly a, a checking and perhaps a debit card relationship. So these are, these are all uh, elements that basically we're, you know, we or other businesses are taking part in the uh, United States, the banking industry. And so when you've got, however, banks or credit unions that may be hesitant to bank directly with marijuana-related businesses, then this, this certainly creates a conundrum for those, for those businesses. And then the other category would be loans. Uh, so while I, I imagine that a certain amount of some of the operating capital uh, could come from uh, venture, private investors. Uh, there also could be circumstances where some of these businesses and centers are looking for some sort of a loan so that they can purchase some of their equipment, so that they can purchase a building or, uh, or office equipment or cultivation equipment, uh, security, et cetera. And so those would be three of the kind of the traditional banking services that, that you might expect. Uh, so I just wanted to also identify that there can be uh, direct banking relationships and then there can also be what I would consider some indirect banking relationships. A direct banking relationship <coughs> would truly be where uh, a business goes in and opens an account. Again, it may be some sort of a deposit account. It could be that they seek a loan. That's what I would consider a direct banking relationship. Um, I will tell you that New Hampshire chartered banks and credit unions do seem to have hesitant to establish direct banking relationships with marijuana related businesses. Reputation risk is apparently a key consideration. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a conflict between <coughs> state and federal laws, which clearly this causes some concerns within the banking industry because these institutions rely on federal agencies for deposit insurance and share insurance and for access to the electronic payment system. Uh, I'm aware of some limited instances of indirect banking relationships by New Hampshire uh, chartered institutions. And let me provide an example. Uh, the example might be that um, there is a multi-tenant commercial real estate facility, could be a shopping center, and within that facility, which has multiple uh, retail sales, there may be a dispensary or an alternative treatment center. So uh, understanding that um, an investor or a customer may have taken out a commercial real estate loan uh, from, a, from a bank or from a credit union to basically finance that, uh, that shopping center. Some of the revenues that come in to that <coughs> borrower to then repay the loan essentially source from activity which is illegal at a federal level. And so that would be what, what I would consider an indirect uh, banking relationship. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I have reached out to Maine, Massachusetts, and Vermont, and I will tell you that all of those states have one or more banks or credit unions 
directly providing banking services to marijuana-related businesses. And in fact, that coincides with Mr. Holt's testimony um, from our last meeting, where he identified that there was a, a Massachusetts bank that was providing the, um, the banking services to the alternative treatment centers that are here in New Hampshire. On that point. Sure. So why haven't the uh, medical marijuana facilities, why is any bank in New Hampshire supported that? Why is that, we still have a, does the New Hampshire Banking Association still have a position on that? We have not taken a position on this. Uh, you know, we, we've certainly, um, we've certainly kind of had eyes and ears open to see uh, what, if any, relationships may occur, but no, we certainly haven't taken a position on it. Um, I, I think I'll go back to the point that I made earlier, which is I, I believe that our New Hampshire Chartered Banks and Credit Unions see this as to some degree a reputation risk. And let's also go back to the fact that the Cole memo identified in pretty no uncertain terms, banks that conduct financial transactions or credit unions that conduct financial transactions for marijuana related businesses could face criminal liability. So because this exists at the federal level and that specter for lack of a better term, it remains out there. I think that's a, a reasonable deterrent for, you know, if I can kind of put myself in the position of our banks and credit unions for them to say, we're going to wait. Now, I think reasonably, um, there's a lot of watching and waiting and, and trying to determine, you know, what if any action may be taken against those institutions that have utilized uh, or, or have engaged in direct banking business. Uh, and so when, when a hammer doesn't get dropped on those banks and credit unions and, and when years go by, there, there may be some less reluctance uh, to engage in that activity. So you, you mentioned earlier that um, New Hampshire Banking Department hasn't developed any regulations for the medical marijuana industry. The other three states that you're looking at, is that the same situation or do they have their own state regulations already developed? Right, so uh, from, from my, just kind of my very general discussions with those states is that they've um, relied on uh, the Department of Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, um, basically the guidance that was um, communicated in February of 2014. And so this is, um, that document does um, outline several um, ideal due diligence uh, elements. Um, and including, and I'll just kind of roughly hit some of them, I mean, one of the things that's expected of an institution is to, if uh, cannabis is in some fashion legal in a state, the expectation is that those banks and credit unions would take the proper measures to determine uh, are those institutions properly licensed and certified according to that, that state's requirements. And then the other very big element, I talked about the Cole Memorandum from the U.S. Department of Justice, the banks and credit unions do indeed shoulder the burden of trying to determine are any of those priority memo uh, objectives being violated or in danger of being violated because if, if they are, the banks and the credit unions have a legal duty to report that activity. Um, so those are some of the things uh, that are required. But I, I think um, in, in more direct answer, um, the states that do have depository institutions are basically making sure that their institutions file, uh, follow that guidance issued by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Senator uh, Thank you. Um, in the states that have uh, legal marijuana you know, legalized marijuana, particularly the ones who have done it for a little bit now, uh, have there been any repercussions to those banking institutions that have chosen to uh, deal with marijuana businesses? I, would, uh, I think the best way that I'm aware of, and again, I'm kind of going anecdotally because these are institutions that I do not have responsibility for, for supervising or regulating, but I'm certainly, I've heard of some things. I'm, I'm aware of some instances where um, a bank or a credit union was not, in the eyes of their regulator, doing uh, a, a, a satisfactory job of tracking and shouldering the additional burden and responsibilities that goes with this. So in some cases, their regulators have said, you, we, we're not comfortable with you continuing to engage in this sort of business. So I am aware that there's been, uh, again, outside of New Hampshire, some banks and credit unions that their regulator have said, you, your program is not up to par. And then the bank has a decision. They can either create, uh, put in some additional investment and some resources to get their program up to par, 
or they can withdraw, and I'm aware that at least uh, in one instance, um, the bank was withdrawn. And, and, and sorry, just one other quick um, oh, no. um, yeah. Um, so I'm also aware out in Colorado, there was an institution which was a credit union, which uh, when Colorado first started the legalization, there was a credit union that wanted to form. It was not yet a charter uh, institution. It was what was known as a de novo application, a new institution application. And frankly, their business plan was to cater almost primarily to the marijuana industry. Um, my understanding is that that credit union did not get granted its authority uh, to open. And, and again, my understanding was the reason it didn't was because the Federal Reserve, um, which basically processes the electronic payments, basically said, we are unable to, to um, <clears throat> come up with a, an arrangement with this institution because they're primarily um, engaged in an activity that's illegal at the federal level. Yeah, follow up on that. When you refer to a regulator, you're talking, you're referring to the federal uh, bureau or a specific person? Um, so in most instances, it's, it's the agency, although you could certainly have a spokesman or a, a chairman or a commissioner for an agency. But in, in general, I'm using the, 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 the broad term of, uh, of a regulator. Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to get to how arbitrary it might be. Excellent question. Um, how arbitrary. So I think there's always the risk of some arbitrary elements, but you, you also have um, at some fairly high levels. So for example, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in some of their, um, in some of their minutes will be meeting minutes will actually indicate they will they will basically say well while we're not necessarily taking a position one way or the other they always come back to and highlight this is this is an activity so the distribution the cultivation and the sale of marijuana remains an illegal activity at the federal level and these are federal agencies that basically have law enforcement and safety and soundness and some pretty um, some pretty weighty considerations for their mission so it's just interesting to see that it comes back to the, the federal illegality so frequently. Just, just, yeah, this is it. <laughs> so that seems to be the sector that hangs over everybody's head and, and the, uh, you know, the thing that's used is that it's still uh, unacceptable for the federal government. It is, it, and if I could just briefly highlight, I mean, so that, that in and of itself is, is an element to consider. Um, but when you're dealing with the financial industry, so much like we're on a commission, so banks and credit unions have boards, boards of directors that sit around a room and make decisions for an institution. Those board members possess individual uh, liability when and if an institution is either in violation of state or federal statutes or if there are safety and soundness considerations. So it, it actually becomes much broader as well as well that the bank's breaking the law well, you've got, in some cases, dozens of board members that also could find themselves subject to civil money penalties um, or other liability that comes from it. So there certainly is a dramatic trickle-down effect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Um, it's my understanding that in the last two annual continuing budget resolutions in Congress, passed by Congress, basically the substitute for not having a real budget, um, there were provisions that forbid the Department of Justice from enforcing any criminal laws against um, lawfully operating medical marijuana facilities. I mean, basically. My question is, th does that prohibition, one, does that apply to banks also? And two, are there other federal agencies that would have criminal law enforcement powers that the banks would need to be aware of? So I, I think I would bring it back to those, um, those priority elements of the Cole Memo. Uh, so a dispensary or an alternative treatment center, I think if they're not violating some of those, and let's just use one for example, uh, selling, selling to minors, um, you know, that, that would be a situation. But you know, let's think about it, because as I've heard some of the testimony here, just even in previous meetings, I'm aware that there are individuals under the age of 18 that are even basically um, accessing therapeutic cannabis through alternative treatment centers. So therefore, at least in the federal definition, they're a minor. Um, so I, I think, right, I mean, so that's just something that I've kind of thought through as I've, as I've listened to this. But I think in reality, um, an alternative treatment center, even though they are for therapeutic cannabis or medical marijuana, 
if, if somehow they run afoul of one of those priorities, I, I think they certainly um, run the risk of, of um, basically criminal charges and penalties. Um, and then certainly certainly the banks do as well. So if, if a bank um, either knowingly or unknowingly uh, transacts some of these uh, transactions, and if they're not properly reporting it, that's, you know, that's where the exposure comes in. Um, as far as the, the other law enforcement, so certainly the Department of Justice, I would imagine the Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, the Department of Treasury, I've mentioned, for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Um, so yes, I would say there's probably several, um, several law enforcement entities that could become involved and interested. Dr. Glassman? Yeah, so what I was going to say following up that was that uh, I think the Omnibus Act of 2015 had an amendment that said the federal government's not really going to prosecute state-based therapy to cannabis programs, but they have the right to if they choose to. Right. And then that was uh, reauthorized this March by current president. So I think they're saying, you almost have sort of you know, two different sort of things going on, but, but it appears that they're not really going to go after any state-based programs right now, but they have the right to if they decide that something legal is being done. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, the federal government requires uh, the payment of income taxes for illegal and illegal activity. So, if the IRS requires uh, uh, any anyone who's doing something like that to pay money, how does that money get transferred through a bank? Do they just show up to the IRS with a bag of cash, or do they actually write a check from a bank somewhere? So my guess, is, so my guess is they're going to be writing a check, and and I'm going to talk from my understanding with the alternative treatment centers. But I think early on in this process, if I would in Colorado, for example, some of the things that I heard is as some of these entities and, and businesses were going to perhaps apply for a license or, or make, make some payments for uh, property taxes or some other taxes, they were literally bringing in cash, duffel bags or briefcases of cash. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, that, again, I think that was kind of early on. And, and my understanding is that there's, there's certainly hundreds of financial institutions across the country that are now directly, uh, have direct relationships, banking relationships with marijuana-related businesses. So my, my guess is, is now you're going to see some electronic payments, you're going to see checks. We'll, 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 as we speak to the states, I'm sure we're going to be hearing about this. And I see Mr. Simon shaking his head as well, but I think he has something to probably say on this as well. Uh, so just kind of following up a little bit more about my outreach to some of the other states, the account relationships that I've seen from New Hampshire's immediately surrounding states are primarily of the deposit account category. Um, so I think one of the one of the risks that uh, and it's a fairly significant risk that's run with a loan relationship to one of these entities is that the federal government, when and if it decided to pursue charges and, and, and enforce uh, the, some of these criminal statutes, could in fact seize assets of the entity. So that could be their their cash and their deposits uh, held in a bank or a credit union, but it could also be the vehicles, the equipment, the premises. That that, is, um, that that entity, whether it be an alternative treatment center or a cultivation center, that that ent entity is operating out of. Mm -hmm. Understanding that one of the, um, so the, the first um, repayment prospect for a bank or a credit union from a borrower is the cash flows from normal activities. Well, if that institution, if that entity is now shut down, they're no longer cultivating and selling the product, so they're, they're not going to have the revenues. And furthermore, if the assets of that entity, the vehicles, the equipment, uh, the premises, et cetera, has been seized by the federal government, then that collateral protection, which was likely in place for those loans, is no longer available. So I, I just wanted to highlight that from the loan relationship aspect, there are certainly some additional risks that a financial institution would, uh, would bear and would have to consider in deciding whether they, uh, they engage in this activity. Uh, so I just, um, again, I'm following up on some of the bullet points that we established early on with this commission and in fact at our first meeting, I know that there was a reference to reaching out to certainly other states within the U.S., but also to Canada. Um, I will tell you, and as I indicated at our first meeting, I do have a very ideal network for communicating with other states, and, and that's through essentially uh, the Conference of State Bank Supervisors and then the National Association of State Credit Union Supervisors. I do not yet have an ideal contact for, for Canada, um, but I've reached out to the Conference of State Bank Supervisors. I've explained to them uh, the banking department's representation on this commission so they understand basically what, uh, what's being attempted, and I've asked for an ideal contact person through Canada. So I, I will tell you, I'm still waiting on that information, but when I get it, I will certainly provide it. 
Um, in the meantime, what I was hoping to receive is if, if we do have some specific questions that we think we would like to pose to some of the other states, um, I'd like to seek further guidance from the commission about what those questions are, and, and I'd be happy to then turn around and, and try to get some replies, or even um, ask to set up some sort of a, a, a meeting where someone could provide testimonies. Okay. We'll try to arrange that. The other thing that would be helpful is to understand why Century Bank mm -hmm. decided. Do you think that's appropriate to reach out to Century Bank? To see why they again, I guess it's a local bank decision that they they want to take the risk. Right. Uh, I will certainly put some thought into that. Um, yeah, let me let me put some thought into that. They may wonder why they're being contacted by you know if, if indeed I reach out to them by the uh, a regulator from New Hampshire. Um, but let, let me put some thought into that. Okay, we have uh, the clock is ticking here, so we have two other presentations we have to get through. So I appreciate your sure. testimony. It's been great. And if you have the commission, so anytime things come up, let us know. Thank you so much. Okay, our next, our next uh, presenter is going to be David Bezier from uh, Thank you. I'm David Rousseau with New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. I'm the director of the Division of Pesticide Control. I did prepare a, a memo to the commission. It's dated uh, November 20th. And in preparation of this presentation, we did look at the eight states that have legalized cannabis for recreational use. I put that on the last page of the memo. It identifies the states, the primary agency responsible for regulating regulation, reg, recreational marijuana in those states. And then the um, agricultural role, which is mostly a, a pesticide role in regards to uh, regulation of the cultivation of cannabis, cultivation being of the growing of, of the plant. And then also li I list, we listed some of the responsibilities of that agricultural or um, pesticide agency. So having said that, going back to the front part of um, the memo, the challenging discussion in regard to the growth of uh, cannabis for recreational use is in regards to agriculture is the pesticides that are used to, to grow materials. Every state has a, a pesticide control agency um, and the use of pesticides is, is, is heavily regulated. If we start at the federal level, the federal law being the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, if I could refer to it as FIFRA, that would be wonderful. Um, but that provides for the federal regulation of pesticide use and distribution. And all the pesticides distributed or sold in the United States must be registered by EPA. Now there are some exemptions, and I'll go through the exemptions, it's important to the discussion. Um, but the, the, the company or the manufacturer must show that pesticides, they must show to the federal government that the pesticides, when used according to specifications, will not generally cause unreasonable unre adverse effects on the environment. And then under Item 1B, we identify the unreasonable adverse effects on the environment as two, two parts, really. One is the environment and public health, and another one is this uh, discussion of tolerance. Uh, a, a, an amendment to the um, FIFRA uh, identified that pesticides used on food, materials that people will be ingesting uh, or putting into their body, needs to have a tolerance so that there's a, an allowable level of, the, of that chemistry that can get into uh, the food that should not be a problem if, if it were to get, to get into the individual. So the discussion in regards to tolerance, if tolerance is uh, under Part C, uh, it must be found that the pesticide poses a reasonable certainty of no harm before it can be registered for use on food or feed. So this part of the discussion is important because if the federal government is registering products and putting a tolerance on it, that, that suggests that there's a, a tolerance for, for everything but cannabis because that's uh, illegal at, uh, at the federal level. So some of the states have been challenged as to whether or not to recognize use of these pr products, these pesticides, to grow crops because they've gone through a federal process and, and they're, they're uh, registered at the federal level. Now some of the states um, allow use of, of, uh, of those products and I, I just want to identify under, under D and E the discussion of section 3 products are the other products that have to go through this, this review to be registered at the federal level. Now some of the states have allowed use of those products, the, the Section 3s, because they say based on the plain label language, it's okay, for, and I'll give you an example, some of these labels, uh, and let me back up just a bit, the label, we, we usually identify the label as being a law. When you use a pesticide, when a pesticide is used, the label has to be followed. 
So on that label it will identify, not always, but mostly the site and the pests it can control. So you will not find cannabis or marijuana in any federally registered labels because it's illegal. But you will find things that are generic enough that other states like Colorado, Washington, Oregon who have, have, have allowed the use of that because it might say something like, okay, appropriate for use on flowering plants, which marijuana is a flowering plant. And those states identify that as the plain label language. So it's allowable because either the site, um, uh, or the pest is identified on the label or something generic enough as flowering plant is, is on the label. Otherwise, labels usually, especially for food, will identify the food crop right on the label. For example, corn, cucumbers, etc. But you won't find cannabis or marijuana. So that becomes the challenge. And if New Hampshire were to, uh, to regulate the uh, recreational use that was grown in the state, uh, we would, it would definitely be something to look at probably through the Attorney General's office as far as allowing the Section 3 products. How about the, the medical marijuana that's being grown today? In the medical marijuana, what uh, New Hampshire did was to identify what's called the Section 25B products. Those are the exempt products from the federal reg registration. Um, not only is, does the um, medical marijuana rules identify that the, the plants must be grown using Section 25B products, but also in an organic method. And that method is, uh, the federal method is actually well described. The, the National Organic Standard is, is something that's, that's well described. So for medical marijuana, what New Hampshire identified was it's okay to use the Section 25Bs because they're not registered with the federal government, and, um, and also if they're grown in uh, organic standards. Now, the, the, the challenge becomes when you move a crop outdoors, there's just greater pest, tra pest challenges, and some of the Section 3s are actually more appropriate because they've been tested and been identified in regard to how they behave in the environment. So that, that's just a question of do we allow Section 3s in, in the growth? So all of the medical marijuana being grown in our state is in indoors? Correct. Yeah, I failed to mention all the medical yeah. marijuana. It's, it's heavily regulated. It's indoor use. It's mostly greenhouse. Greenhouse. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Does that include the food product that might be? In, in regard to medical product? marijuana? Yeah. Yes. The, 20, the Section 25B products are the ones that have to be used in the organic standard m m method. So it's all lumped in together or? differentiated in any way by what else might be in it. Right, any product that comes out from medical growth, medical marijuana, is, is subject to this, yeah. Okay, thank you. So Section 3, again, Section 25B, that refers to the FIFRA law. Section 3 being registered at the federal level, Section 25B being exempt. And those products, the exemption products, are actually there's a list of them. They're considered minimum risk products. It includes mint oil, corn oil, products such as that. Um, it, it gets a little uh, challenging in, in some of the Section 3 products are actually a, a very minimum risk, like there's some bacteria type bacillus products which are, they go through this federal reg registration which are very low minimum risk and very helpful in controlling uh, things like spidermites and aphids. They're not real chemicals, they're, they're more uh, bac bacillus. So, and those are Section 3, so not having those available, you kind of limiting the number of pesticide tools you have. So I think that's where you'll see in other states they have allowed some of the Section 3s. It's, it, it, it just allows more tools to deal with the pests. So that's, that's the, the federal discussion. And again, the bottom line being, do, would New Hampshire allow the use of the Section 3, a federally registered product, or just hold the, the grower to the Section 25B? Then the, the other part of the discussion, I just wanted to identify what we have in place right now for pesticides controls. In New Hampshire, we do have a statute, I think that is uh, item two, that's the statute number. And folks that grow products and use pesticides, uh, no matter the commodity, if they use pesticides, and no matter if they're 25B products or Section 3 products, they're supposed to have a license to grow in New Hampshire. So it doesn't matter if they're crop. If you're using pesticides, you need to have a license. Uh, we listed the rules here under three. Those are our pesticide control rules. There is a board. The pesticide Control Board, is, they have the authority to adopt rules and they oversee the, the policies of, of pesticides and pesticide use in the state. Uh, again, number four, the, there is a permit requirement. And uh, under five, there's two types of permits. One is called the general use permit. Those are the types of, uh, if a product's being used that's uh, called the general use pesticide, general use of the type of over-the-counter type pesticides, the kind that are found in, in stores and don't require a license to buy. If you have that kind of pesticide, you're using that, you don't need to take an exam. If you're using what's called restricted-use pesticides, 
you need to take an exam. Um, as far as I know, there are no restricted use pesticides being used on, on growing cannabis or marijuana in, in the United States, as far as I know. So that, that class of pesticide is usually a higher risk. Uh, our permit fees right now, just to, for discussion, uh, if you were to get a permit, you need a $20 fee and there's a $5 exam fee. Again, there's ex an exam requirement if you use restricted use pesticides or this other piece, and this gets a little confusing too, um, some products have what's called a worker protection standard identified on them. They're agricultural use type pesticides and, and what that means is if you want to have, uh, to use those type of products that have this agricultural use statement on them about worker protection, you'd have to take the exam in the action. And what the worker protection standard is, it's just the farmer explaining to the worker the importance of being careful with pesticides and uh, how to respond if there's an emergency uh, or behave in, in the sense if a pesticide is used you may not want to go into that area that's of pesticide use. And that's identified in the label, usually the re-entry times. Um, <coughs> New Hampshire does require, if you have a permit, a, a license with New Hampshire, you, you record the daily use of pesticides, you submit an annual report of what you used, what the pesticide name is, what you used it on, if it's a farm, the number of acres. Um, and then there's also an option to do train over a five year period for recertification credits, rather than take the exam every five years, you can maintain credits, and that report is due annually. Uh, under section, on part nine of the memo, we identify all the types of permits that we have in regards to uh, the, the um, agricultural type uh, license, and as you'll identify, greenhouse is on that list as C, we don't have a cannabis or a marijuana uh, section. We, we put the medical marijuana under greenhouse because the growing methods our greenhouse methods. If we were to expand to outdoors, I would suggest we had a separate category for, for cannabis, as we do for Christmas trees. Different type of pests, different sites. Um, and then the last, the last page, I, I just identified that we do have um, compliance assurance, we do education and outreach. Um, we also do inspections, and we have enforcement authority. We have been to all of the medical marijuana facilities um, and then the last piece, the last bullet here, 11 under cannabis considerations. Again, the question, what pesticides would be allowed in this state? Would they, would they be section threes or just the section 25 Bs when we talk about recreational outdoor growth? Uh, should it be a new permit category? And should the exam, we have specific exams for each crop and these are just things that we would need to consider if we were to adopt this type of program in the state. Having said that, that's all I have. So, so right now with medical, there's no permit needed. Greenhouse. Yeah. We actually, uh, um, and uh, out of concern for the worker protection piece, have people go through the exam. So the folks that at the medical marijuana facilities are supposed to hold the New Hampshire permit and, ha and are required to go through the exam. Yeah. You know, just something you don't know, you can find out for us. Are there other states that grow cannabis marijuana outside? Yes. Okay. For, for recreation use, yes. For recreation use. Yeah. If that happened here, we'd have to have the most regular regulation on this. That, that would be the question, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, how many, are there any uh, non-state approved uh, marijuana growers that are licensed in the state? Do you know of any? In, in this state? Yeah. Not that I'm aware. So they're, they're not regulated whatsoever, and they don't have to apply for uh, certificates or inspection at all? I guess I'm, I guess I'm confused. So is the question that if medical marijuana right now is, is regulated, right. so you would have to have a permit and a license. Right. But if they're not licensed, you know, if there's an illegal grower, or, you know, if, if any, I'm assuming they're not really getting that in New Hampshire, but if do you have heard of any other states where there are illegal growers getting these certificates for uh, pesticides? No, I'm not aware of it. Um, so thank you. That's very helpful. Um, on states that have um, moved to recreational growth by use pesticides. Have there been adverse impacts? I know there was a story in California of someone who was on therapeutic cannabis for um, to um, for cancer and then ended up getting severe pesticide poisoning. Have you um, heard of other examples like that? Yeah, I'm not I'm not aware of that, that case. But one one thing that is important is that the product be tested. You know, whether it's a random sampling or a requirement for each batch. Um, and you'll notice, if you look at Alaska, they actually have a list of, um, they're like recall, like we have uh, food recalls. They actually have a recall list for, 
for a certain marijuana products if they have a level that begin with a tolerance that uh, might have been found or an illegal pesticide that was found in the crop, they will, will, will highlight it. And then it's the Department of Agriculture in those states that oversee that? that? That, it's different each state. Alaska would be the, um, under the Department of Environmental Conservation. <coughs> um, California is trying to put together their own uh, tolerances for the products because the federal government doesn't doesn't do that, as I mentioned, but, but California is a robust program with the ability to do that. So I guess the, 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 in response to your question, to make sure that doesn't happen, there needs to be some kind of a, a sampling and check. And how does that happen if there's no federal regulation? It would be state by state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So David, you mentioned as far as you're aware that only general use pesticides are being used in these greenhouses to treat for any sort of pest. Is that because the marijuana is very resistant to pests? Or why hasn't there been any um, requests for say restricted use pesticides mm -hmm. for in New Hampshire that you're aware of? Yeah, what I'm aware of in the, in the medical marijuana growing is it's a very um, confined environment, greenhouse. Um, so from seed to, to mature plant, your the ability to to keep pests from from being a problem, uh, you have a better chance of doing that, controlling the pest. And the three things that are, are most uh, challenging, what I'm hearing in the medical marijuana going are spider mites, aphids, and um, and molds. Yeah. So yeah, and how the how the aphids and the mites get in when you're just starting with a seed, I, I I don't know. But 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 I'm also what I'm hearing is the products that are available, the general use type, the lower minimum risk type products are working. Um, the uh, Section 25Bs do work, but, but I'm hearing that they, there's sometimes the Section 3s that are, as I mentioned, the Bacillus products are very good with aphid control and spider mites. So to have that Section 3 is helpful for the, for the, uh, for the growth. But again, those are, are also general use materials. Okay, okay, thanks. thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I guess if the question is, is, is the medical marijuana growing like a, if they have similar pests as the house plant, I would say, yeah, they, pro they probably do. What I don't know is the difference between uh, a large scale outdoor growing uh, operation and, and the pest component there. I just, I'm just not aware of that. Oh, wouldn't you expect, though, Oh, definitely. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, they're, they're just the wind, wind question alone blowing things in. The variables are greater for, to have more pests in the outdoor environment. Thank you. Mr. Representative, talking about agriculture, um, since one of the issues that Blake said is wisdom measures in our state wisdom measures falls within the Department of Agriculture. Uh, you know, you may not know this off the top of your head because you work on the pesticide side, but uh, when it comes to our medical marijuana, do you know that? Weights and measures will go into every grocery store and check every scale, or check check every every pump, gas pump, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that's measured is done dealt with. Do you know if they're going into a medical marijuana and making sure those scales are? You know, if the, the scales are required to be to be registered, and um, but I don't know as far as the enforcement uh, piece if we've been in with those facilities. I, I, I certainly will. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. For those of you who don't already know me, I work for the Marijuana Policy Project. I have been a public advocate for marijuana policy reforms for over 10 years. 
I founded the New Hampshire Coalition for Common Sense Marijuana Policy in, in January of 2007 and uh, was a volunteer with that organization for a couple of years. I was hired by the Marijuana Policy Project in late 2011. That is a national organization. It's a nonprofit that's based in D.C. Uh, my work expanded overnight from one state to, at the time, 17 states that I was the point person for. I've had the privilege of being able to travel to many states as an advocate and also to tour uh, marijuana cultivation and retail facilities in several states where those are legal and to attend conferences, hear presentations from experts on a wide range of these issues. Uh, my academic background, I have a master's degree in English. I was a double major in English and philosophy. So I don't consider myself to be a particular expert on any specific aspect of marijuana policy. I've tried to approach this issue as a generalist, trying to understand, at least on a baseline level, all of the important ways that cannabis and cannabis policy uh, are looked at. So for the first part of my presentation, I want to mostly build on the information that was presented by Carmen Hansen from the, uh, the National Conference of State Legislatures last week, talk about what's happening in other states, uh, with a particular focus on, on what's happening here in New Hampshire. I've also mentioned, because I'm already feeling it, I've been coming down with the cold. I think my voice will hold up for the next hour. I hope it does. If not, that's why. Um, so as you can see, 29 states uh, and D.C. have medical cannabis laws. Eight of those states passed adult use laws. Until recently, they were all on the West Coast. The adult use laws, uh, which the Massachusetts and Maine, in blue. And that has, I think, changed the conversation significantly already in New England. A little bit more detail on Massachusetts. I think there has been some confusion. Um, <coughs> marijuana is legal now in Massachusetts. It's legal for any adult 21 and older to grow, to possess, to share with other adults, and that's been the case uh, for almost a full year. Uh, Massachusetts did pass decriminalization, medical cannabis, and legalization, all via ballot initiative. Uh, legislators in Boston were not interested in dealing with this issue. They left it to the voters and the voters uh, passed those reforms. Uh, when decrim passed and medical cannabis passed, those were basically implemented the way they were written with minimal meddling from the legislature after the fact. Uh, the adult use initiative was a very different story. Uh, the legislature promptly uh, passed a six month delay Retail stores were initially supposed to be open by January 1st of 2018. They pushed that back to July 1st, 2018. Since then, they've uh, proceeded and legislative leaders have ensured that there will be no further delays beyond that. Uh, so they went to work and over the summer passed a bill that modified the initiative substantially. Uh, initially, it allowed for uh, a tax rate that would have been a maximum of up to 12%, including a 2% local option tax. Uh, what the legislature came up with uh, was increasing that tax rate to 10.75% uh, plus the 6.25% general sales tax. Uh, that's 17%, and they raised the local option tax to up to 3%. So the maximum tax rate in Massachusetts will be 20%, and that was signed by Governor Baker in 2017. So there's still a commission working on regulations, putting some of the, the details of policy into, into rules and regulations, but legislatively, this is what's been trying to Can you come give us the slides? Later on? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They're already on this computer, and that's why I'm not going to have to do that. Yeah. <coughs> so, one of the issues in Colorado has been that uh, many local municipalities decided not to allow retail sales, and that's resulted in marijuana only being legal uh, for a safe regulated market in a uh, minority of the state. In Massachusetts, what the legislature determined was that the 260 municipalities where the initiative did have majority support the towns may, town cities may ban retail stores, but uh, they would have to pass a local referendum to 
do that. And in the 91 municipalities where majority of voters oppose the initiative, uh, they can be banned simply by the town board or the, the city council if they choose to do so. Uh, but whether retail comes to every town in Massachusetts or not, uh, it's currently the case that any adult can grow and share with their friend. Similarly in Maine, uh, Maine's had decriminalization since 1976, and in 99, voters passed a medical cannabis initiative uh, adding an adult use initiative last November. That took effect uh, January 30th of, of this year. And just like Massachusetts, it's already legal for adults to grow and share. Just recently, Governor LePage vetoed the legislature's bill that would have implemented the regulations and taxes. And the House, just a few weeks ago, fell short of overriding that veto. So they will take up the issue again in January. For that reason, I'll present to you a lot fewer details on what's happening in Maine. Those are, many of those are yet to be determined. But I will share a couple of comments from, from legislators that I think are indicative. Uh, and so one is, if we don't go ahead and move, we're going to create incentives for the wrong people. I feel like we legalize gas, but not gas stations here. Uh, by failing to pass legislation, we are driving people to the illegal dealer on the street corner. And that's from the co-chair of the special committee on, on marijuana implementation. We're saying it, it technically is legal in Maine for anyone to uh, 18 or over or whatever. 21 and over. 21 and over. So what the issue, issue is, is that yes. we're debating whether or not we're going to sell it as a state in Maine. That's, that's correct. And I believe they're required to do it by the initiative, but they have substantial leeway in the legislature to delay that and continue I think they have to get there, but there's no clear timeline on when they have to get there. So, so, so if someone stopped in Maine and has, has marijuana on them, they won't they, within a certain amount, I guess. They will, they will not be fined or arrested or not subject to not any subject any to if they're 21 and older and complying with the limits in the law. That's right. Uh, Even though we there are no stores. Yeah, I, I, that's why I use the gas, the gas station. Right, no, that's that's exactly. And some people can produce their own fuel. fuel. Some people have biodiesel and can turn cooking oil into something that will run their car. Some people grow their own cannabis and share it. The overwhelming majority of people who use cannabis would prefer to buy it from the store. The same way they buy alcohol from the store or put potential So right now someone can grow and be okay within, again, the same number of plants? Correct. That's right. I'm, So very briefly, Canada, uh, they have a very different system than what we have here. Uh, and federalism seems to work very differently there because in Canada, it was a determination from the federal government that we're going to legalize cannabis and do it by July 1st of 2018. Uh, but the details are being left largely to the provinces to figure out for themselves. So there's a bunch of debate going on now in all of the Canadian provinces about what policies they should be doing Interestingly, in Canada, it will be a minimum age of, of 18, it appears, uh, nationally, uh, and provinces can make that higher if they wish. Uh, the, the drinking age is also 18 in Canada, and it's 19, I believe, in some, some provinces. So, Vermont, we'll spend a little bit more time on Vermont, uh, in part because it is a legislative state and one that has been, I think, a few years ahead of New Hampshire in in, in uh, addressing this issue. There have been several studies already in Vermont, and I've had the privilege of working closely with committees and, and now a study commission in Vermont as they've waited through these issues over the last few years. Um, so they got started with medical cannabis significantly before New Hampshire passed the law in 2004. It's only the second state to do so legislatively. And uh, in 2013, they decriminalized possession. In 2014, the legislature approved a study, not a study commission like this one, but a study. And the executive branch contracted with the RAND Corporation to produce that study. It's called Considering Marijuana Legalization Insights for Vermont and Other Jurisdiction. Uh, it's presented to the legislature in January of 2015. 
And there's a lot to the Rand Corporation's report. Uh, but I think what was most immediately useful to legislators was to see the picture of what is happening today in Vermont uh, and to be able to understand that. So about 80,000 Vermonters using each month, consuming between 33,000 and 55,000 pounds of marijuana each year and spending about $175 million each year buying it from the illicit market. So New Hampshire's population uh, is about double Vermont's population. We have a nearly identical rate of, of uh, use. So this is a, just the back of the napkin. If we double the numbers in the RAND report, I think we'll find that about 160,000 grant staters use cannabis regularly and maybe spending about $350 million each year buying cannabis from the illicit market. So when people say marijuana prohibition has failed, I think this is the main thing that they're talking about. The idea of having a war on drugs, a war on marijuana in particular, was to eradicate marijuana use, to create uh, a drug-free society. This was the buzzword we heard throughout the 80s and, and well into the 90s. And that simply hasn't succeeded. So if this is a public policy issue, like other public policy issues, I think it certainly behooves us to look at outcomes and try to determine the extent to which outcomes might be improved by different policy approaches. If it's simply a moral issue, then we don't need to do that. But if it's a public policy issue, I think the implications are clear. This is a policy that hasn't achieved <coughs> certainly the goals that were laid out for it. And, yeah. Senator, I mean, just a quick sure. question. Uh, those numbers, the Rand Corporation, the 160? No. That's my back of the back map. These, it's all about to my knowledge, nobody's. And who was the Rand anyway? Who's Rand Corporation from before? The Rand yeah. Corporation is. I probably a, should know. I don't. They're a uh, think tank, uh, public okay. policy research organization that uh, has an entire unit uh, that does drug policy and criminal justice policy. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Generally, well respected. I. So. Like I said, it's a very detailed report, uh, and they go into really many of the topics and even subtopics that, that come up. So just a couple of snippets. One, one thing was that they acknowledge the total social cost associated with alcohol use is very much larger than all costs and outcomes related directly to marijuana use. And that emergency room dis discharge data suggests that marijuana related visits remain a very small proportion and are dwarfed by the rates associated with alcohol and opiates. So, in part, on the basis of the information in the RAND report, the Vermont Senate uh, voted to pass a legalization and regulation bill in 2016. Uh, then Governor Peter Shumlin was a strong supporter of that legislation. He said the war on drugs policy and marijuana prohibitions failed. We can, we can and should take a smarter approach. And uh, others, such as the Department of Health Commissioner at the time, Harry Chen, he, he was not a supporter necessarily of the legislation, but he, he did comment very favorably about the potential for a regulated market to produce better outcomes in areas that are of great importance to people like the Commissioner of Public Health. He noted that our smoking rate in teenagers is about 13%, but the marijuana rate is about 37%. One's regulated, one's illegal. If you do it right, there's ample room for improvement. So, um, in that grand study, is there a difference between smoking marijuana and, and edibles, or do you get to add all of these? Uh, I mean, is that a question? How, do, how does edibles, I, mean, I guess people can make marijuana brownies at home, but uh, is there an industry out there that's selling edibles in Vermont or other states? Well, there isn't in Vermont. There certainly is in Colorado. Yeah, and so all of the states that have legal regulated sales do include edibles and infused products mm -hmm. in, in that regulation. And the RAND report does talk about that some. I'd be happy to talk about it more. I want to see if I can get through my, my yeah, slides. Sorry, I mean, just, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it'd, it'd be helpful if you could also forward us the copy of the RAND report. Mm -hmm. yeah. I included a link. Do you have a link right here? Yeah, okay. a link right here. And okay, yeah. great. That's fine. Okay, and, and similarly, uh, 
from, from a law enforcement uh, prosecuting attorney's perspective, the, at the time Attorney General and two former AGs signed a letter arguing uh, in favor of regulating marijuana and they wrote, instead of subsidizing gangs and cartels, we failed prohibition policy and we believe Vermont should focus on reducing the harms associated with marijuana and other drug use through prevention, education, treatment, and smart enforcement strategies. We strongly believe that these goals can best be achieved through regulation, not prohibition. So that's how the debate was progressing. And then the 2016 election occurred. Uh, Vermont elected a new governor, one who does not, who did not at the time support legalization. Um, the House and Senate passed a bill that would have simply legalized marijuana possession and cultivation. It would not have created a regulated and taxed market. Uh, not that the House, there were not, there was not enough support in the House to frankly, the pass a regulated and taxed market. The Senate position is strongly in favor of a regulated and taxed market. The House uh, wasn't there yet, but wanted to focus on the issue from a criminal justice and civil liberties perspective. So they uh, approached it in that way, developed this bill, which the Senate agreed to. Governor Scott vetoed that bill. It surprised some people by indicating in the veto message that he would be willing to support compromise version, so that compromise was worked out with legislators, said it passed a compromise during the veto session in June, and the House was not able to take that bill up, it was only a two-day veto session, so they didn't have time for them to do so. Uh, the House is expected to pass that bill early next year, when we is expected to sign it, and we should take it by uh, July 1st of next year, uh, much like the other, the other policies and other states so just a few weeks ago, the House Speaker, uh, who's not a supporter, particularly of legalization, uh, publicly said yes, the House will act on something. Just that quickly, before the House is ready. And Governor Scott did the same interview for uh, seven days that as long as there's a year to compromise, we can do it until we have to go to sign the bill. So, Carmen Hansen wasn't comfortable making any predictions, but I'm more comfortable saying I would I do believe that Vermont will pass at least uh, this first step of marijuana legalization, allowing women to cultivation for adults, and then that will take effect next summer. And when it takes effect, New Hampshire will be surrounded by states that allow women to cultivation and sharing on their adults. So in September, Governor Scott signed an executive order creating a study commission. Based taxation and regulation, which is generally now being seen as a second phase of the marijuana legalization. People accept that from a criminal justice perspective, the penalties are going to be eliminated for those use of possession and probation. But uh, there's, I believe, I uh, share that belief that regulation and taxes are more complicated and require more liberation. So, for that reason, this study commission. It has actually three subcommittees. One is focused on education and prevention. One is focused on roadway safety and, uh, and crime. And one is focused on taxation and regulation. They began meeting in late September. And the tone, I was at that first meeting, the tone has been very, very much that this is not a should we do this commission. This is a how should we do this uh, commission. And that's from the very top. The tax commissioner is the chair of the taxation and regulation subcommittee. He described it as a, a how-to commission, and Governor Scott's uh, general counsel agreed with that publicly at the first meeting. So yes, that's the direction that we went forward, looking uh, to figure out the best way for the market. So on to New Hampshire, which I'll describe briefly, assuming you're rather more familiar with it. Uh, we have a much later start on marijuana policy reform, having uh, not passed medical cannabis until 2013, and having not uh, reduced penalties for violation until this year. Uh, so we've caught up at least on those two fronts. The House voted to decriminalize possession eight times between 2008 and 2016, but it's not again in the Senate. 
And uh, so in 2015, we were reporting to data from the FBI Uniform Crime Report. There were 4,675 male auto arrests in New Hampshire, 999 for distribution, and 3,676 for possession. I would estimate, based on what's happened in other states, and the Rand Corporation also did this for Vermont, they said that the effect of becoming Vermont was about an 80% reduction in arrests. So, you can see about an 80% reduction in arrests here. And that would be a substantial change from the criminal justice perspective. There would be less time with police officers instead of dealing with the cases. There would be something with the right tickets. Uh, that people can pay through the mail rather than having to uh, be arrested and then show up for court. The police officer won't have to show up for court either, except for perhaps for their case for some domestic violation. So that's been in effect in New Hampshire since September 16. Now, the uh, immigration is in effect throughout the So that's what's happening. Uh, in, in the states around us. Uh, if there are any questions about that, I can answer them now. After that, I want to go very briefly into um, it. It's been a couple of months since we the, the criminal vision. Are there any statistics yet on the list in New Hampshire? I'm not aware of, of any at all. And I, and I would add that these statistics that I cite from the Report. The only way to get those is to request them directly from the FBI to put out all of this data that they don't tell you they don't separate marijuana arrests from drug arrests. They just put out the drug arrest numbers. So I don't know why they do that. But, uh, the question, well, is, it, is it proper to ask the fellow commissioner a question or representative from the state police? I wonder if they have any <laughs> insight themselves about arrests. Mm -hmm. Not since I'm Yes, uh, part of the numbers can be misleading from the FBI as far as where those arrests, did those arrests involve any other arrests where they sold marijuana possession? There was some of that was in possession of marijuana when they were arrested. So, yeah, so you have to, you have to understand the facts. Okay. Hey. So back to my, uh, from a more academic perspective, I mentioned the public advocate for the last 10 years. Like my involvement with this issue really started when I was in college to, in 1994, I was trying to write a paper on this and went to the university library to try to see what's actually true about marijuana. I mean, growing up in the 80s and having been subjected to the war on drugs, um, to just say no rhetoric at the time, it was uh, something that I was very curious to know if there was actually good evidence to back up what the truth was learned. And I was astonished by how little I was able to find at the time. Before the information was. I became a college English instructor in 1990 for seven years. And over the course of those seven years, the ability to find students how to do research, how to write research papers, how to engage in public policy issues, how to listen to the ones that issues the top students pretty much everywhere. I'm at least somewhat interested in somebody wants to write their paper. Many students write their papers on marijuana over the years. So, um, really remarkable to see how those uh, how their sources uh, became better over time as more was published and as more was written more credible uh, scholars and academics on this issue. So, this is a book called The Marijuana Conviction. Uh, if anybody wants to do a very deep dive into the history of marijuana and marijuana policy, which was written by with President Nixon's commission in the early 70s on uh, the, the Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse and 
they did extensive research into history and this is the book that they come up with. So to condense all of that into just a couple of slides, uh, cannabis has been around for thousands of years. Humans have used it for a very long period of time. It was really introduced to the United States and England and, and other Western countries in the mid 1800s uh, by a physician who had traveled in India and discovered how it was being used there as medicine. So cannabis became used, and it was called cannabis, which is a scientific term. Uh, nobody would have known what marijuana was, I don't think, in 1850. But cannabis was, was uh, known as something that was available at pharmacies, something that was uh, used. And in 1937, it was prohibited. So one of the aspects of the history that never, I never see getting talked about is that the people who were pushing for it were not so much scientists and medical professionals. We would all like to believe that at some point all of the best scientific minds and medical experts got together and said, okay, what are the relative harms and benefits of all of these various substances that people can ingest and let's make policy accordingly based on that. I think if you study the history of the debate, you will find that that was not the case with cannabis and that in fact it was the American Medical Association that was arguing against the Marijuana Tax Act. And here's a quote from a letter that they sent to Congress in 1937. So it says, the medicinal use of cannabis is not caused and is not causing addiction. The prevention of use of the drug for medicinal purposes can accomplish no good end whatsoever. How far it may serve to deprive the public of the benefits of the drug on further research may prove to be of substantial value. It is impossible to foresee. And I think that quote turned out to be really prescient. Uh, what happened after 1937 was that cannabis was removed from medical textbooks, removed from the pharmacopoeia. Its history of being used as a medicine was largely forgotten. People stopped calling it by a scientific term. They began calling it by a slang term, marijuana. Uh, and its use became primarily associated with certain ethnic groups, uh, most prominently Mexicans. And other subcultures. So this brought about what I would call an era of cannabis ignorance. Uh, in 1970, the Controlled Substances Act passed. Marijuana was placed in Schedule One, the most restrictive schedule. President Nixon's commission actually did a lot of work and determined that marijuana should be decriminalized. That. They weren't saying it was harmless or safe or that decrim would be a panacea for anything, but they did not believe that the harms of the substance, given the harms of other substances and given you know, the traditional idea that Americans should be free to make their own choices unless there's a strong argument to the contrary, uh, they, they said it should be decriminalized, but the report was largely ignored. In 1976, uh, by then, some patients had begun to determine, discover medical benefits. Robert Randall uh, was a patient who sued for his right to cultivate and use cannabis. And this led to the federal government creating a program where they supplied him with a monthly supply of cannabis. And it ended up uh, serving 13 patients, I believe. Four of them are still alive today, and they're all still receiving cannabis, and it's called the Investigational New Drug Program. One problem with that program was that they weren't actually interested in investigating anything. So as Irv Rosenfeld, who visited New Hampshire in 2012, as a stockbroker, lives in Florida, and has, they sent him a canister of marijuana cigarettes every month, uh, <laughs> courtesy of uh, U.S. taxpayers, and he came up here to testify, and he's, he's written this book where he details the fact that nobody was ever interested in understanding why cannabis helps with his rare condition, even though it obviously does and has, and his doctor has written these reports and tried to send them to the federal government. They just weren't interested. And one of the criteria that they set up when they created the program was they told Robert Randall, we'll give you cannabis on one condition. Don't tell anybody. Do not tell anybody. Robert Randall didn't care. He told people and ended up signing up many more people for the program. It was closed in 1993 or 1994 to new applicants. Uh, and 
and the reason that was done was because it became clear that cannabis was helping some patients with the symptoms of AIDS. And Robert Randall was working with those patients, and they were submitting applications to the IND program. Uh, it was, you know, it, it was uh, as, as you will likely recall, people suffering from AIDS were experiencing A, pain, particularly neuropathic pain, which is the sort that uh, it appears cannabis is, is particularly helpful with. They also suffer from wasting syndrome, so many of them were losing dramatic weight dramatically. Cannabis helps stimulate their ab appetite, help them deal with their with their pain, and that's why the program was closed in 1994. Since then, uh, sort of jump ahead to 2013, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who you may know is CNN's chief medical correspondent, was was discussed as a potential Surgeon General under the last administration, uh, but he is somebody who was against medical cannabis and wrote that he would vote against medical cannabis as late as 2009. By 2013, he had completely changed his, his perspective after traveling around the world and after uh, looking more deeply into, into the literature. So he says, doesn't have a high potential for abuse and there are very legitimate medical applications. In fact, sometimes it's the only thing that works and that it was not because of sound science, but its absence that marijuana was classified as a Schedule One substance. So this became a state issue uh, because the federal government was simply not responsive to the patients, and in fact shut down that program, as I mentioned, in 1994. So there's a petitioning process under the Controlled Substances Act, and there have been numerous petitions to reschedule out of Schedule One. The DEA's administrative law judge held hearings in 1988 over the course of several months and ended up producing a very detailed report that found in part that marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known and it would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious for the DEA to continue to stand between those sufferers and the benefits of the substance. That was 1988. That recommendation went nowhere because the DEA's administrator uh, was an appointed executive branch bureaucrat, for lack of a better term, decided we're not going to do that. And they went to court. The court upheld that it was the administrator's authority to decide and marijuana was going to stay in Schedule 1 because that's what the DEA decided. And that led directly in in California to the passage of the first state level medical cannabis law. States, beginning with California, recognized that if the federal government's not going to take action here, we need to do whatever we can to protect sick people in our state who are using this plant and make sure that they're not dragged through the criminal justice system. So here we are 20 plus years later. All marijuana remains illegal under federal law, with the exception of those four patients in the IND program and anybody participating in, in federally authorized research. Anything else is illegal under federal law. The DEA has fewer than 5,000 agents in the world. They are not going around arresting people, particularly patients, for a small amount of marijuana or marijuana plants. That has never really been the DEA's policy, uh, but so it's highly unlikely that individuals be prosecuted. However, it is all still illegal under federal law, and people do have rights denied under federal law, uh, including uh, the right to purchase guns and ammunition and, uh, and, and other rights. So, poll numbers. I understand that poll numbers are not in and of themselves a reason to pass any particular reform. That in some cases voters might be wrong about things and, and very likely are very wrong about some things. Um, however, I think it is important that we look at the poll numbers and try to understand what they mean, try to understand why opinions have changed. So Gallup's been asking since 1969, do you think marijuana should be legal? In 1969, the answer was 12% said yes. 
It got up to 28% in the late 70s, and then throughout the 80s and 90s, uh, stayed below 30%. Uh, since then, it has really been a substantial increase in support nationwide, uh, now up to 64% of America. It's not limited to the population. So Pew did a study last year of nearly 8,000 police officers nationwide. Uh, more than two-thirds of them believe marijuana use should be legal for personal or medical use. 32% of police officers said marijuana should be legal for, for any use. Another 37% said it should be only medical. So a very substantial minority of police officers now believe marijuana should be legal. Many doctors also support the marijuana prohibition. I'm not aware of a similar poll of the scope of the Pew poll of law enforcement, but many, many doctors have spoken up in favor on this issue. Uh, recently, in the American Journal of Public Health, uh, a few physicians, including a former Surgeon General, Joyce Lynn Elders, uh, published a article laying out why physicians can, should, and in some cases do support legalizing and regulating marijuana. And yeah, there's a quote. Although marijuana regulation has not been perfect, it is far better than the prohibition of the place and the worst fears of opponents have not been material. In New Hampshire, the polls are slightly stronger in support than nationally. The most recent poll is 68% support. If you look at the age demographic breakdowns, I think that's where you really see what I would call inevitability. 89% uh, of grant staters between 18 and 34 support legalization. 73% of grant staters 35 to 49. Among uh, 50 to 64 year olds, it is 68%. And then 65 and older, you see a dramatic difference of only 36% support. So unless the younger generation changes its opinion dramatically for some reason over the next few years, I, I think we're only going to see uh, the overall number continue to increase. Looking more closely into those breakdowns, it was 79% of Democrats, 74% of Independents. For the first time, a majority of Republicans at 52%. 65% uh, of gun owners. Uh, and 57% of active military and veterans. And there's a link to the poll if you'd like to. I, I would encourage you actually to look at the cross caps and see there are many other demographic categories. So what does this mean? Obviously, we're not going to have a ballot initiative in New Hampshire. But we do have a constitutional system. We do have a constitution that explains that all government of right originates from the people and that it's founded in consent. And I think the polls do clearly indicate that grand staters have withdrawn their consent from this policy. Uh, it remains a felony offense to grow a single cannabis plant in New Hampshire. And I don't think that is a policy that's founded in consent. If policymakers are not willing to change these policies, I think the burden of proof is on those policymakers to explain uh, to the majority of grand staters why they're, they're wrong. So opinions have changed for, I think, many different reasons. But the biggest one is that prohibition hasn't worked. If it had worked, we would not be here having this conversation. Uh, the idea was that it was going to stamp out use. And we know that hasn't happened. Instead, many, many people have personal experience with marijuana and concluded that it's less harmful than alcohol. Many people who don't have who have never used marijuana themselves have at least observed its use and have also been to parties where people engaged in binge drinking or other illicit drug use and have seen that the effects of marijuana pale in comparison with the effects of alcohol. So the consequence of having a prohibition that doesn't work is that you wind up with tremendous demand for a product that is illegal to produce and illegal to sell. That creates an incentive for gangs, cartels, 
and other uh, illicit actors to grow, transport, and sell cannabis to the people who want it. So it has resulted in the enrichment and empowerment of drug trafficking organizations. And we have a system where there is no regulation and control of the product. So we refer to marijuana as a controlled substance. And yet we have a policy where there is no control. We don't know who's growing it. We don't know who's selling it. Everybody who's doing any of those things is committing a felony. Uh, consumers don't know what they're getting. They don't know whether it's 5% THC or 20% THC. They don't know if it has pesticides. They don't know if it has heavy metals. They don't know if they don't know very much about it at all. They're buying it on the basis of the, that it's green and it smells the way they want it to smell in most cases. Um, so imagine walking into a brewery or a bar and not knowing if the beer you were ordering was 5% or 12% and trying to make responsible choices accordingly. Uh, so flash forward into the 80s and 90s I'm sure you all remember the fried egg ad because this ran for well over a decade. Uh, done by the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, which I'm very pleased has changed its, its name over the years a few times actually. But they're now called something that I agree with, like Partnership for Healthy Kids, or I forget exactly what it is. But uh, they're no longer trying to achieve the utopian dream of a drug-free America. They are promoting reasonable policies that uh, I may or may not agree with all of them, I'm not entirely sure. But this is, this brings up what I think is really critical because the main argument against all of these reforms for years has been that they send the wrong message. I've heard that more times than I can possibly count in the last 10 years. And as an educator, as a former educator, this is, uh, of great interest to me, because I, I ask myself, what is the point of education? Why, why would we want to educate people? Usually, I think of education as being about trying to increase knowledge and understanding. But if you increase, the fear seems to be that if you increase people's knowledge and understanding about cannabis, they might be more likely to use it, and that would be unacceptable. So we're told that that goal is in conflict with another goal, which is to scare young people and make them not want to use cannabis at any cost. I think there are parallels there both with sex education and American history or probably others. Uh, in the case of sex education, you know, explaining to young people what sex is and how it works, they might be more likely to do it. Well, that may be true, but there's a, there's a flip side to that coin where they need this information, don't they, at some point? And isn't that what education really is? Uh, similarly, if we teach students everything about American history, they might reach some conclusions that aren't the ones that we intend. But do we omit the things about American history that we don't want young people to learn? Well, I hope not. I hope we, te we teach them the whole thing, at least at some point. Maybe not in kindergarten, but at some point. What's the goal of drug education? Well, for most of my life, I think it's not had very much at all to do with increasing knowledge and understanding. The D.A.R.E. program in particular, was founded by Daryl Gates, who was uh, uh, the police chief in Los Angeles. And he is famous for saying, or infamous, I think, for saying uh, to Congress, to, to the Senate Judiciary Committee, that he thinks casual drug users should be taken out and shot. And when he was called out for that comment, he said, yeah, you know, he's talking about people who blast some pot on a casual basis despite the illegality of the act. So that's a pretty strong statement, and I hope we've advanced somewhat beyond the point where there would be a more substantial reaction against that if somebody in a leadership position said that casual marijuana users should be taken out and shot. Goals of policy in the 80s were to create a drug-free America. At the same time, I'd be watching a baseball game and somebody would hit a home run, and the big Budweiser logo would pop up and they would say, congratulations, Mr. Baseball Player, this Bud's for you drink up everybody and celebrate. We had a culture that did not recognize alcohol and tobacco as drugs at all. And that meant marijuana and with heroin and cocaine and, and all, of the, all of the truly dangerous illicit drugs. 
uh, kids were taught to resist something called peer pressure, which was exemplified by a phrase, everybody's doing it. Turns out that was a really bad message. And kids to this day, I think people, anybody working in prevention will agree now and share this frustration that you ask kids about how many of their peers they think are using marijuana and they dramatically over exaggerate. They think that most of their peers are using cannabis. In reality, the numbers are, are much lower than, than, than they perceive. Um, so part of that, I think, goes back to truly ineffective and, in fact, counterproductive drug education. <clears throat> education that was aimed at creating what Nancy Reagan referred to as an atmosphere of intolerance. She wrote, those who don't take an active, hostile position against drugs are giving their tacit approval. We must create an atmosphere of intolerance for drug use in this country. And uh, President Reagan himself said, marijuana is probably the most dangerous drug in the United States. Objectively not. So, the main objections I have heard to ending marijuana prohibition, number one by far is that it sends the wrong message. In other words, policy outcomes don't really matter. What matters is creating this atmosphere of tolerance. Uh, that to me has been the biggest frustration is getting this issue to be talked about the way we're now talking about it here. So I'm very pleased that this commission exists and we are talking about this as a public policy issue that, that and we are really interested in looking at outcomes. <clears throat> Some say it will result in carnage on the roads. Others say it will make the opiate problem worse because marijuana is a gateway drug. So briefly on those three main objections. Federal policy continues to undermine research and informed discussion. So. We've heard mention of the Rocky Mountain high intensity drug trafficking area in particular. And my experience in Vermont was that 80 to 90% of the objections from opponents came either directly or indirectly from the Rocky Mountain high intensity drug trafficking area report and other similar reports. Rocky Mountain high intensity drug trafficking area is funded by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, which is also known as the Drug Czar's Office. So I hope you find this shocking. Uh, their Reauthorization Act of 1998 requires them to ensure that no federal funds shall be extended for any study or contract relating to legalization of the substance listed in Schedule 1 and to take such actions as necessary to oppose any attempt to legalize the use of any Schedule 1 substance. So ONDCP is required to oppose what New Hampshire is talking about maybe doing. And I would submit to you that one of the ways that they are going about that is by funding the Haida organization to publish these reports, which are not academic. The, the authors of the re these reports have no academic credentials. They're not peer reviewed. They take data, they use it, they cherry pick it, and they present it in a deliberately misleading fashion. Much of this is explained in footnotes throughout the report. But most people don't read the entire report. They read the executive summary, which is comprised of a bunch of very scary sounding statistics. <clears throat> Example of those footnotes. Uh, this report will cite data sets with terms such as marijuana related or tested positive for marijuana. This does not necessarily prove that marijuana was the cause of the incident. Uh, so it does not. The fact that something shows up in a statistic as being marijuana related does not mean that the driver was necessarily impaired at the time of the crash. It merely means that they had some amount of THC in their system. And it doesn't indicate that they were at fault in the accident. So you could theoretically be sitting at a stop flight and you get rear-ended by a drunk driver. And if you had cannabis in your system, you would show up in these statistics, I think, because you would be the driver in a fatality and you would test positive for THC, you weren't the cause. So the other issue, and this will be one of your issues that you encounter, I think, when you hear from other states, is the data problem that they had. They were not keeping consistent track of these things prior to legalization. So in the case of driving fatalities, between 20, 000, 2012 and 2015, there was not 100% reporting of fatalities when there was THC present in somebody's system. 
after legalization, they started to mandate 100% reporting. Well, the numbers went up. It's how much of that was due to reporting becoming consistent and how much of it was an actual increase, really not clear. <clears throat> uh, I'll tell you what the state's regulators themselves have said. So this is just from a few weeks ago. Uh, Dr. Larry Wolk, who, by the way, I think would be excellent if, if you wanted to hear from him directly. He's Colorado's chief medical officer and executive director of their Department of Public Health and Environment. He's a pediatrician, somebody who I think was not enthusiastic at all about legalization to begin with. Uh, but he says, we've not experienced any significant issue with driving as a result of legalization. We've actually seen an overall decrease in DUIs. And that's something Governor hickam Lupers also mentioned. They, they dramatically increased their training for law enforcement at every level to detect impaired drivers. And they've actually written fewer citations. In, in, in the last year, they experienced a decline in, in total citations. So by some measures, it looks like the situation is actually improving with education and regulation. Um, but certainly the sky is not falling, and certainly the numbers presented in the Rocky Mountain Hyde report are cherry picking this week. Um, so there are other studies, this one was in the American Journal of Public Health. Uh, we found no significant association between legalization in Washington, Colorado, and subsequent changes in motor vehicle crash fatality rates. <coughs> also found no association when analyzing available state reported non-fatal crash statistics. So does cannabis impair psychomotor function? Yes. Yes, it does. Does it do so on the same level as alcohol? Not even close. And I would suggest that you talk to some people who are really experts on that. You'll be more probably inclined to believe them than me. But there's some very good research out there that uh, shows that the increased crash risk associated with having marijuana in your system uh, is roughly, well, the best study I'm aware of has it at something like 20 to 30 percent increase. And so uh, driving while texting by comparison would be a 2,300 percent increase. You're 23 times more likely to be in an accident if you're testing. Uh, so having THC in your system is substantially less uh, likely to lead to a crash than having alcohol in your system at even half the legal weight, uh, half the legal limit. So that's a good thing, I think, to hear from real science experts on. I'm not one. Uh, Dr. Gupta is, and, and he did mention this in, in, a, in a TV appearance, uh, that the long-term impact of alcohol versus marijuana is much worse with alcohol, the, hypocr the hypocrisy is, is quite stunning. On the opioid question, we heard when we were proposing medical cannabis that, that, that this would be a problem, that, that marijuana is a gateway and would lead to harder drugs. So far, that plainly hasn't happened, and the available evidence suggests that it's had a beneficial effect. States that have safe legal access to medical cannabis dispensaries, that's associated with about a 25% lower state level opioid overdose mortality rate. And very recently, a study that was published found that Colorado's legalization resulted in a 6% uh, uh, per month reduction in opioid related deaths, so 0.7 deaths per month. And that this represented a reversal of the upward trend in opioid related deaths in Colorado. The DEA itself admitted last summer that little evidence supports the hypothesis that initiation of marijuana use leads to an abuse disorder with other illicit substances. I believe a link on that in case you don't believe me. And to the extent that marijuana use can be a precursor to other drug use, I think it's important to ask why that would be the case. And I think one of the obvious reasons would be the fact that if we have 160,000 marijuana users in New Hampshire, we have a policy that requires them to obtain their product from illicit drug dealers, illicit drug dealers who may also have other substances available. So the Institute of Medicine alluded to that 
concept in their 1999 report. They said there's no evidence that marijuana is a stepping stone on the basis of its particular physiological effect, but instead the legal status of marijuana makes it a gateway drug. You have to buy it from drug dealers who might turn you on to something else. That's one of the goals of a regulated market, is to create a situation where cannabis consumers can not be exposed to the illicit drug market. Um, one of the handouts I've given you includes all of the available data from all of the states that have legalized, all of the survey data on teen use. Um, this is just the Colorado Healthy Kids survey, which, uh, is, which uh, shows that the sky plainly has, has not fallen in that regard since marijuana was regulated for adult use. Another thing that I think is a really good place to start in making sense of this issue in this debate is to look at the recent correspondence between current Attorney General Jeff Sessions and the governors and some of the attorneys general of Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and Colorado. A.D. Sessions wrote a letter to all those governors and they all responded uh, in defense of their state's programs. So Oregon Governor Kate Brown says there could be no denying that Oregon's benefited from this industry. Uh, tax revenue, job creation, and, and uh, cost savings to the criminal justice system. A dismantling of the coal memorandum would have the opposite effect, driving the existing lawful product into the unregulated black market and funding criminal enterprise. Similarly, Washington Governor Jay Inslee, state and federal prohibition of marijuana was failed to prevent widespread use, which was generating huge profits for violent criminal organizations. People of Washington State chose a different path. Alaska Governor Bill Walker points out that, the, that traditionally the police powers are left to the states and not to the federal government. And Governor Hickenlooper, who was initially very much opposed to legalization, said that if he could wave a magic wand and not have to implement it, he would do so. He now says that their system has become a model for other states, that when abuses and unintended consequences materialize, the states acted quickly to address and result, uh, any resulting harms. And, uh, so one example there would be edibles, and I'll mention, talk about that for a couple of minutes. Initially, uh, it was legal in Colorado to sell edibles up to, I believe it was 100 milligrams in, in, in one serving size. That was the standard under medical cannabis. And there needed to be a lot of education around that. And there was at first. Uh, people who perhaps hadn't smoked since the 70s or 80s, <laughs> and wanted to use marijuana would, would try an edible product and it would, uh, they would, they would overconsume and they would experience unpleasant effects. So Maureen Dowd is the, the shining example. She's a New York Times columnist who went to Colorado. She bought a 100 milligram candy bar and they told her this is 10 servings, only eat a tenth of this. Well, he, she ate a tenth of it, but it takes about an hour or more for an edible product to kick in. So. She ate a tenth of it, it didn't really do anything, she ate the entire rest of it and spent the next several hours in her hotel room having an unpleasant experience. The good news is that there are not cannabinoid receptors in our brain stems. So the, the part of our uh, body that regulates things like heartbeat and breathing are not affected. You're not going to die from a fatal cannabis overdose. It's never known to be one. Uh, but obviously, we don't want anybody to have bad experiences with cannabis. So regulating the products, restricting the serving size to 10 milligrams per serving, uh, and having a public education campaign. I was proud of my organization. We partnered with some, some of the industry people, did a campaign called Consume Responsibly. We had billboards that said, don't let a candy bar ruin your vacation. If you're going to use edibles, start low and go slow. And one of the things, if you read Governor Hickenlooper's letter, they mentioned that uh, there was an initial spike in calls to poison control centers and emergency room uh, admissions, and that that trend was reversed with education and, and regulation. Those numbers actually went down last year, and uh, in, in part because of restricting the products. So this is something I found from the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform. 
It dates from the early 30s. And I think it's analogous to the debate that we're having now. Um, the people who support any marijuana prohibition, for the most part, we're not saying the marijuana is safe or that it's something people should go around using without thought or consequence. What we are saying is that prohibition has utterly failed and has produced terrible consequences that are analogous to the consequences experienced under alcohol prohibition. <clears throat> Put the bootlegger out of business, take the profit out of crime, restore respect for the law, and educate your children to temperance in the home, the school, and the church. So temperance is an ancient Greek, I mentioned my philosophy, degree. Temperance is an ancient Greek concept described by Socrates and Aristotle. The idea is not to indulge, to overindulge in things to the point of not having a good, balanced, productive, virtuous life. Uh, temperance is voluntary. Temperance is something you decide to do. Prohibition, temperance movement gave way to the prohibition movement. And I think that conceptually they're very different. It's one thing to promote the idea of abstaining from substance use. It's, another, it's a secondary important thing to promote responsible use for those who are going to consume substances. That's very different than saying that people should be subjected to the criminal justice system if they do make those choices. Certain members have other things. My last slide. Oh, you don't, you don't do. So the supplemental materials that uh, Jen was kind enough to print out for all of you, they're all available under the legalization tab on our website. It's just a list of the titles, but I think you have them all, so you probably don't need them. And I'm going to conclude there, and I see that we're over time. I'm sorry I haven't left time for you to grill me with, with questions, uh, but I, I'd be happy to stay as long as we'll, we'll come back again. I'd be happy to come back. Okay. But we have time for one or two questions. Here. Does your organization take any position on taxation? Uh, we support treating marijuana similarly to the way alcohol is currently treated. We believe it should be legal for adults to use, to grow, and that there should be a regulated system where they can buy it. We think it makes sense for there to be taxation associated with that so that to the extent cannabis is associated with harms, that there can be dollars available for education, prevention, <coughs> regulation, and, and et cetera. So yes, I, my organization was the primary organization behind Amendment 64 in Colorado. Uh, my colleagues wrote the Alaska Initiative, the uh, Massachusetts Initiative, the Maine Initiative, those all include taxation, so yes, we're, we, we certainly do support that, however, we don't, we tend not to take a lot of very specific positions about how a state should go about doing it, but that's the general premise that, that, we, that we support. Yeah, this is more just a comment um, that I wanted to bring attention to the committee, especially on the, the documents that it can um, help fight the opiate epidemic, the JAMA article that is quoted here, and Carmen Hansen's materials, you'll note that she had said that even the authors of this article of the study that show the reduction do not um, agree with how generalized that comment has been, so I just caution this. And a lot of um, what she said before is, you know, correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation for, you know, things such as what was cited about the decrease in opiate use in Colorado. If there's no, you know, direct, we don't know direct cause, a lot of that could be due to a lot of the policies that have been put in place, like Narcan use, just like in this mm -hmm. state. So it's an overgeneralization. I just want to point that out, that um, if you read through Carmen's materials, um, there is uh, a counter-argument to a lot of this. And just to be clear, I did not use the word causal. And I've spent more hours than I can imagine talking about the difference between correlation and causation to college students and how important that is. What I will say is that when these laws were being considered and passed, the, the, express, the opponents said, this is going to cause the sky to fall in the following ways. So that plainly hasn't happened. Whether 
I do believe it's causal. I believe in 10 years we'll have the data to show that this does have a positive impact. It certainly hasn't had a negative impact. Uh, well, there was a recent report from the Journal of Psychiatry that actually showed an increase to opioid overdoses. So I think the thing is we just don't know yet, and it's too soon. We don't have um, the research. I think we can all agree that there's just not enough research to make general comments that there's, um, you know, it can be, you know, linked to decreases in opioid overdoses. Just want to follow up on, on this Ward's comment about taxation. To me, there's, there's a point in which some states may overtax, pushing people back to the illicit market. Can you just comment on that? Absolutely. It seems like Mass is getting close, just to get to 20%. <laughs> Actually, the 20% in Massachusetts is substantially lower is than any okay. of the West Coast states. And that was part, I was on that drafting committee, and that was one of our, you know, we believe that a lower tax rate is certainly likely to achieve, help achieve that goal of driving people in into the regulated market, that if you overtax cannabis, you risk having it remain on the illicit market. I think in both Washington State and Colorado, that was an early lesson that they learned. And in both cases, they reduced their taxes somewhat in those states uh, to respond to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just real quick, I want to comment on uh, one thing in particular that was brought up regarding the overdose deaths. You know, similar to what my committee member mentioned. I mean, clearly here in New Hampshire, we've had medical marijuana for the past two years, and overdose deaths are still increasing. So my point being, that doesn't mean that our mar medical marijuana program is failing here, but you need to look at the actual numbers, and you need to look and understand the facts behind the numbers. You can't just present something and say, you know, well, this, uh, we, if we do this, this is what's going to happen. You have to look at all the other factors that are involved. And, and that's what I would ask uh, the rest of my committee members. I dearly wish we could spend the whole hour talking about just that issue. That's part of what motivated me to get involved in this in the first place. When I moved to rural eastern Kentucky in 2003 to take a job at a community college, I was absolutely shocked to see that there are bars on the windows of every pharmacy and that People think of the opiate crisis as something that just hit a few years ago. This is something that hit me smack in the face in 2003, 2004, and 2005, and was shocking to me. And at the time, I saw a state that was really going all in on the 1980s strategy. They were flying the helicopters all over. They were running drug dogs through all the schools because they thought if they could just get all the marijuana, that that would break the gateway, and they wouldn't have a drug problem and the opposite was happening. They were getting some of the marijuana. Kids were smoking maybe less marijuana because it's so easy to interdict, it's so easy to smell and spot from the helicopter. Instead, I have students who are 18 years old writing essays for my class about how they started, started snorting pain pills at age 13 in school. So this is a very complex issue. The fact that we lump cannabis in with opioids as a matter of policy has, has I agree, it's confounding on a number of levels and it takes more than a few minutes to understand. But I see regulation of, of cannabis production and sale as something that's ultimately going to be really beneficial. I hope that continues to be part of the discussion. And we are going to, we are going to get many, many points of view on this. And uh, we thank you very much for your testimony. We definitely will have you back. I'm sure you'll be here. I will be here, yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and adjourn the meeting. Uh, we meet again on December 18th, Monday at 9 a.m. We try to keep the meeting to two hours. So for your scheduling purposes, try to keep it within the two hours. Thank you all.